Jonah chapter 2 this evening. Father, we thank you for your word. We pray for the peace of Jerusalem, not just for the Israelis or for the Christians, but for the Arabs, the Muslim quarter, Lord, for the nations around them. Because the peace of Jerusalem means a lot of families will stay intact, homes won't be destroyed, and in many ways the world suddenly upended. There's so much more writing on that prayer, Lord, than just a government or a group of people. But in many ways, Lord, it's, it's really the epicenter, the hub, Lord, of even world politic. So we pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We pray for those in the charge and authority that you give them wisdom. And we pray for our own government, our own leaders, Lord, also give them wisdom as we are in an interesting time. This pandemic has slowed a lot of things down, but not the hatred that's there in the Middle East. And so we ask, Lord, that you would just move, bring people to yourself. We thank you, Lord, of how we've heard in the last few decades more Muslims coming to Christ, some argue, than perhaps in the last 1,400 years. And how we pray, Lord, you would draw people to yourself in the midst of that land. And Lord, as we open your word, may our hearts be open this evening, and may the book of Jonah work in our lives and strengthen our walk, we pray. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So chapter 1, last week we saw <clears throat> the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city. We showed you an idea of one rendition of perhaps how large. It's a three-day walk. Cry against it, for their wickedness has come before me. And we discovered from history that they were quite wicked indeed. And Jonah, facing the prospect of going up there and not being well received and perhaps having several of the following done to him, his tongue cut out, his eyes gouged out, being pinned to the ground, having his skin flayed off of him, perhaps having his hands and his feet cut off, and then perhaps being impaled on a pole. These were all the kind of things the Assyrians would do to those that they would take captive or to those they would attack, and obviously to do it to inflict and, and instill fear in the hearts of those that they would seek to conquer. And so it is a very wicked city, and you can't help but wonder how much that's on Jonah's mind. And as you know from last week, he ran down to Joppa, paid the fare, hop on a ship, and tried to get as far away from Nineveh as possible. Of course, during the course of that, a storm rose up. The people began to panic on the ship that they would run aground. As they were emptying the ship, they found Jonah asleep. And of course, wondering what's going on, they cast lots, and the lot fell upon Jonah. And they asked him, what is your occupation? Where do you come from in verse 8? What is your country, and what people art thou of, or who are you from, is the idea. And Jonah let him know that he feared the Lord God who made the sea and the dry land. And they were shocked to find out that he was running away from the very creator of heaven and earth. And so they asked him, what can we do that the sea might be calm for us in verse 11? And he said, I know these things have come upon you for my sake. So pull me up and essentially throw me into the sea and it will be calm for you. But verse 13, they rode hard trying to bring the ship to land, but they could not. And the sea wrought, and it was tempestuous. And so they begged and beseeched God, saying, We ask that we would not perish for this man's life. Lay not upon us innocent blood, for thou, O Lord, hast done as it pleased thee. Verse 14. And they took up Jonah, and they cast him forth into the sea, and the sea ceased from her raging, its own testimony. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice unto the Lord and made vows. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish. The word is dag in the Hebrew, fish. A great fish. And note this carefully. The Lord had prepared. Prepared is translated five times. The word here is mana. Five times prepared. Fourteen times number, to number an item. Appointed four times. Tell or set. Tell three times. Set one time. God had a special ops for a great fish. Now, the beauty of this is the last time we taught this was 2009. 11 years ago. Since then, certain things have come out, so we're going to show you some slides early because you have the people out there who mock and scoff the idea of something that big that could possibly swallow Jonah, that could be used to keep him and, and all that. So let's just look at what we've learned since 2009. The uh, article here is titled Open Wide. The diver who nearly got swallowed by a whale shark on July 21st, 2011. Mr. Handler traveled to Isla Mejeres in Mexico and used high-tech equipment to capture the incredible moments underwater, whale sharks. Whale sharks have mouths up to 1.5 meters wide that contain up to 350 rows of teeth 
Despite their size, they do not pose a risk to divers. Each year, they converge in water off Mexico, where they filter feed by sieving plankton from the water. And they swim with their huge mouth open, sucking masses of water filled with spawn into its jaws. This is coming from the UK Daily Mail, again, around the year 2011, July. And so here's a photo of a diver with one of these things. The photograph was taken during a feeding frenzy of more than 600 of the 40-foot animals gathered to feed on tuna spawn. Other amazing pictures from this session are taken by photographer Mauricio Handler to show the shark suckers of the other fish attached to the animals as they swam through the sea. Now, these photos are genuine photos, by the way. People go, well, they're Photoshop. No, these are genuine photos, came off the Daily Mail, and you can go and look for them yourself. It says, they are beautiful animals and are incredibly docile. <laughs> he said, once I was accidentally hit by a whale shark when I failed to get out of the way in time while it was feeding. It gave me a good whack as it went by, and I certainly felt it. I got some great so uh, shots of shark suckers, little fish, which hitchhike on the fish. So here we go. That's a big mouth. Hopefully you guys can see it up front here with uh, the screen. But this diver almost got sucked into the mouth of a massive whale shark while it fed on thousands of plankton. The shark, the sea's largest fish, is actually incredibly docile. The relieved diver escaped from the encounter unscathed and continued to enjoy the presence of the extraordinary animals, again, July 21st, 2011. Another photo of some divers around it. Mr. Handler, a 49-year-old father of two, said the picture of the diver staring into the gaping jaws of the shark was an incredible adrenaline rush. I led an expedition of photographers, and when you're down there with a fish or with the fish, it's like living in another world. On our last day, I was taking a photograph of a whale, and it ended up swimming at my photographer's friend. They, didn't have very good eye they don't have very good eyesight, but the diver managed to get out of the way. If he had been sucked into the massive mouth, the shark would have just spat him out. He fits. So does that mean perhaps, and I'm not sure which fish it was, but it sucked Jonah in and the Lord had to say, hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it. Look at that one. A new study has found that animals in the Goldilocks zone, which are neither too big nor too small, face a lower risk of extinction on both sides of the scale. This, again, talking about whale sharks coming from another article on this. But you can see these things are pretty big, and they swim around, and generally around the area of Mexico. But that brings up another issue. And that was, since the last time we taught Jonah, on May 12, 2010, a year later, scientists were stunned as a gray whale was sighted off Israel. Jerusalem, the appearance of a gray whale off the coast of Israel has stunned scientists in what was thought to be the first time the giant mammal has been seen outside the Pacific in several hundred years. The whale, which was first sighted off the Herzliya in central Israel on Saturday, is believed to have traveled thousands of miles from the North Pacific after losing its way in search of food. It's an unbelievable event, which has been described as one of the most important whale sightings ever, said Dr. Aviad Shinnan, chairman of the Israeli Marine Mammal Research and Assistance Center, which identified the creature. A population of gray whales once inhabited the North Atlantic, but became extinct in the 17th or 18th centuries and has not been seen there since. The remaining colonies live in the western and eastern sectors of the North Pacific. It's on the wrong side of the planet, swimming in the Mediterranean. Now, there's more than that. Here are the whales that are found even to this day in the Mediterranean. And yes, some of them are quite large, including sperm whales and other things. And these different maps on the outer ring of this slide, we'll put this out on the web for you guys, but the ring on the outside shows you what part of the Mediterranean these can be generally found. And again, here's another list of ones that are regularly seen on the left-hand side, ones that are occasionally seen on the right-hand side, again, including even sperm whales, which are extremely large. So also types of sharks. There's, the Mediterranean is quite large as a body of water. You just look on your map and you think it looks so small until you fly over it. And then you realize how long it takes to get over the Mediterranean. So something quite large, perhaps a whale shark or wherever it is, but if God can bring a gray whale about, what, eight years ago into the Mediterranean so they could spot it, and it belongs over here in the Pacific, then God could easily divert, say, a whale shark or something else out of Mexico and bring it here. Because after all, the account is very clear that the Lord prepared a great fish. 
He sent it to this territory, to this region, where Jonah and his crew were in trouble because Jonah needed some transportation. And so God was arranging that for him. But the idea of a fish that is large enough to swallow someone is easily shown. In fact, there are accounts from the 1800s during the whole whaling boom of people being swallowed and being found. And they're out there and you can read them. And some appear to be genuine. Some appear to be perhaps fantasy. Uh, but there have been accounts of other people being found when whales were harvested, having been swallowed. So is it within the realm of possibility? Sure. Because if God's in it, anything can happen, right? But there are plenty of great fish that you can find in the Mediterranean. And so chapter 1, verse 17, the Lord here prepared, again, number appointed, tell, or set. He had a specific fish in mind for this job that he sent that way large enough. And again, these whale sharks and others, 40, 60 feet long, plenty of ability to swallow these things up. How many remember when I showed the... Um, Sperm whales that were harvesting, they were hunting in pods for the fish, and they would come up, their massive mouths would open, and well, I showed that a long time ago. That was a fun one, too. You see how big they are. It's, it's, this would be easy. But anyway, back to our account. So a great fish came and swallowed up Jonah. <laughs> and these guys in the boat watched him. Whether, whether he ran out of energy to tread water and began to go down, or he was there going, it's all right. <laughs> and out he went, one way or the other. Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. And I think perhaps the most shocking thing of this account is chapter 2, verse 1, the first word. Then. I have no problem with God having a fish large enough to swallow a human being. The thing I'm just blown away by is it would take three days and three nights for him to finally pray. I don't even think the thing's mouth would have been shut on me before I started praying. Jonah is just so out of sorts with God that he's there three days, three nights, and then he decides, perhaps I ought to talk to God about this. Then, then Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God out of the fish, again, dag in the Hebrew, fish his belly. And he said, I cried by reason of my affliction. You know, it's funny, but affliction, A, opens our heart to the scripture, and B, opens our mouth many times to God. It's often only an affliction that sometimes we really even turn to God. Affliction often will get people's attention. I cried by me reason of mine affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me all the way down in the ocean. God could hear him. And he heard me out of the belly of Sheol, that's the Hades or Sheol, basically this place in the heart of the earth, out of the belly of hell, cried I, and thou heardst my voice. The question comes up as we look at this, did Jonah actually die? We'll look at it in a few verses or some of the words that are used. Uh, possibly he did, possibly he didn't. We'll take a look. When will we know for sure? When you get to talk to him face to face. One day in God's kingdom. What is obvious, as he has been in rebellion, thrown over the ship, taken now, swallowed up by this great fish, now being brought down basically through the water. What is obvious is he's getting a little taste of, number one, what it's like to be out of the will of God, two, to be separated from God and suffering punishment from God. And if he, in fact, died and went to Sheol, his soul descended there into Hades or Sheol, then he really is a sense of what it's like to find yourself in torment and judgment from God having rebelled. He's getting a taste of Nineveh's future, judgment. Out of the belly of hell cried I, and thou heardst my voice. For thou hast cast me into the deep, in the midst of the seas, and the floods come past me about. And that would almost seem to indicate the idea that he first basically went underwater, perhaps out of exhaustion, no longer able to swim. And who knows if he can swim? But as he's going down and the sea's wrapping over him, perhaps then the fish grabbing him. Again, we'll know for sure when we get to heaven. But this description of going under. All thy billows and thy waves passed over me. Then I said, I am cast out of thy sight. He sowed, and now what? He reaped. Cast out of thy sight. Wasn't that what he wanted? Wasn't he running away from God? 
You know, the psalm says, God gave us our request but sent leanness to our souls. Sometimes we work so hard to get involved in things that really we ought not to, and God finally lets us have it. I said, I'm cast out of thy sight, yet I will look again toward thy holy temple. That had to be challenging. Fish, which way is east? Look again toward thy holy temple. How many remember King Solomon? All right, four of you. When he dedicated the first temple, the temple David wanted to build, but because David was a man of war and had too much bloodshed and basically defeating Israel's enemies and defending his own life, he was not allowed to build the house of the Lord, but David, waiting on the Lord, was given the plans and the layout, and he stored up iron and brass and gold and silver and many things for the construction, arranged for the wood to come down from, from Tyrim and Lebanon through Joppa into Israel, got all these different things he began to put in place. Solomon builds it, and when Solomon builds it, he then dedicates it to the Lord, and he prays really a very profound prayer there as they were inaugurating the worship of this first temple. And as he was basically pouring out his heart to heaven and, and spreading forth his hands to the heavens, he said, Lord, if your people get in rebellion or get carried captive away, and he had all these different scenarios of where God's people had turned away from the truth they knew, began to walk in rebellion, God began to correct and judge them. And when they woke up in that correction and judgment, if they would turn their hearts back to that temple and they would cry unto the Lord to be restored, that he would hear them. It was all about his prayer there in 1 Kings 8. It's a wonderful prayer to go look at, to see the grace of God even when his people become wayward and turn and realize their error in 1 Kings 8 there and cry out and ask for God's redemption and forgiveness. So Jonah, in many ways, from Solomon's prayer, turned again looking toward God's holy temple, seeking that the Lord might forgive him. The waters come past me, even about to the soul, nefesh. The deep closed me round about, and the weeds were wrapped about my head, which makes me wonder if he was floating perhaps on a large area of plankton. And then poof, something came along and grabbed him. Curious, we'll find out when we get there. But you're rolling around inside the, the gut of some sort of great fish, and you've got seaweed and all kinds. It had to be absolutely disgusting in there. Hot. I don't know how rich the oxygen saturation was for that chamber, you know. And then the question is, is the fish constantly coming up, taking breaths, and then going back down? So, you know, is he coming up and breaching, just give Jonah a little bit of a wild ride? You know, I mean, there's, there's all kinds of things that could be... Well, I look forward to hearing about it. I went down to the bottoms of the mountains. The earth with her bars was about me forever. Back in those days, they did not have snorkels, scuba gear, mini subs, subs, or even swimsuits. So how in the world could he know that at the bottom of the ocean, you're going to find the base not only of mountains, but in the middle Atlantic Ridge and other places, you find, in fact, entire mountain chains. And you find also pathways and cavities and just different channels that you have underneath the ocean as well as currents on top of the ocean. If you take the time to go through your Bible, you're going to find quite a few things mentioned about the deep, including freshwater springs or springs of the sea mentioned by Job and elsewhere. Here you've got this idea again of the bottom of the mountains underneath the sea. This is knowledge of a realm that they have no technology to reach. At the bottom there of volcanic islands and other things, indeed, you will find the base of these mountains and indeed entire mountain ranges underwater, massive ones underwater. I went down to the bottoms of the mountains. The earth with her bars were about me <clears throat> forever. Yet thou hast brought up my life from, and here's our word, shakath, corruption four times. This is where it gets interesting. The pit, 14 times. Destruction translated two times, one time translated grave. And this is why some people feel perhaps Jonah indeed did die and God simply again would revive him and then he would be ejected from the fish. But we're going to have to wait and see. So if you're of the opinion you think Jonah died, you're welcome to have that opinion. There's an interesting word here about the idea of going down to the pit. If you think he simply basically had a horrendous experience and then ejected, I would hang in there with you on that one as well. And these are the things I wait to ask God in heaven that are in the mental file cabinet in the back of my head. When my soul fainted within me, again, some looking at that as well, I remembered the Lord. 
When the chips are down, where do you look? Who do you turn to? Positive thinking? Other substances? Phone a friend instead of crying out to God? Jonah really has nowhere else to go. God has a way of doing that in our lives. When we've been playing cutesy with him and running away on some issue, he will eventually just put you in a corner where you really have nowhere else to go. He doesn't do it because he, he hates you. He does it because he's seeking to correct areas of our lives, especially as his children. God will often put us in a corner on something that he's been trying to get our attention on, and, and patiently he'll work with us, and then finally it's just checkmate. It's time to just surrender. Time to just tip the king over and say, I'm done. You win, uncle. I'll get it right. But you brought my life up from corruption, O Lord. Verse 7, chapter 2, When my soul fainted, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came in unto thee into thine holy temple. No matter how far away you might be, God hears you. No matter how far from God this evening you might be, if you'll turn around and ask his forgiveness, God will hear you. What a blessing to know, no matter how much you mess up, God is still willing to hear you. They that observe lying vanities. One of those lying vanities for Jonah was you can disobey God aggressively, actively, knowing his will, because again, he's a prophet. God's revealed to him will or, pro, or a calling for him. This isn't just he has a hunch. This is God speaking directly to him. You are to go to Nineveh, the great city, preach against their wickedness. God making his will known and Jonah running as far as he can from it. You see, because to whom much is given, what did Jesus say? Much shall be required. And often, the greater the light, so to speak, of the knowledge of God's truth, God's word, the greater, in a sense, the abuse when we willfully sin against that light. You know, we've got things going on. We were talking about an article just before the service of one part of the church now, you know, basically turning on some key biblical issues. They're, they're essentially deciding that even though God's word is very clear, they're going to essentially go their own direction and sin against the light. It's a dangerous place. They that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy. Beware walking in willful rebellion to what you know is true with God, because then he must correct you. If he doesn't correct you, you've got to ask the bigger question, are you really his son or daughter? But I will sacrifice unto thee with a voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that that I have vowed. In other words, all right, I'll do what you said. Salvation, that's Yeshua. Salvation is of the Lord. How many would say Jonah's come back, in a sense, to the Lord to get right with him? How do we know? Verse 10. And the Lord spake unto the fish. All right, he's had enough. Let him out. And it vomited Jonah out upon the dry land. And you can't help but wonder if the fish was leaving if it didn't go... Tastes like chicken. <laughs> Out he went. I also wonder in my mind as he, he ejected him from his mouth, and, you know, if you're in a 40-foot animal, and it really got its intestinal track online there and decided to just give you the heave-ho, that might have been pretty impressive. You know? And then to just crash on the beach, look up, and here's a little sign saying, Nineveh, two miles. That would be... Quite the object lesson. And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. There's beauty in that. Chapter 3, verse 1. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. He had completely rebelled. He walked in the exact opposite direction. He made plans to basically, you know, ditch on God's plans, go as far as he way as he could from it, didn't care who. And, and there's, a, there's a very important lesson there. Jonah's sin of rebellion and running away from God, he didn't care who it impacted. It impacted the sailors and impacted the value of the cargo on that ship and almost cost them their lives. You think about when, you know, when you want to get into rebellion with God and get wrapped up in sin, you, you often think you're just it's, just, it's just me and God. I'm only impacting me and the Lord. That's not true. And so here, this rebellion and sin of Jonah has impacted quite a few people, not to mention there's a whole lot of storytelling when they get home. And in spite of those failures, 
God wants to use them again. Satan wants to tempt you, deceive you, and get you to fall. In fact, John writing to us said, if we say we have no sin, we lie, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You see, maybe this evening you have absolutely failed God, or worse yet, maybe this evening you've spent part of your walk with the Lord in absolute rebellion to him, completely just flying in the face of God's truth, but you've given yourself some sort of excuse why it didn't apply to you or why you didn't have to surrender to it or why you think it's been redefined and it doesn't really mean that in his word. And you have perhaps even gone through a long, painful experience of unfruitfulness to where in many ways your sin has essentially swallowed up the fruitfulness of your life, much like this whale with Jonah. But if you get right with him tonight, He'll work again in your life. One of our favorite places to go in Israel, and I hope we get back there with all that's going on in the world, but one of our favorite places to go is where Jesus restored Peter three times. Do you love me? Because Peter had denied him three times. And to have him not only be restored, he had to be restored with the Lord. It had to be public because his denial was public. And it had to be in front of the disciples because he had been boasting just a, you know, three days before that that he would never forsake them. So this, this restoration or that period of time where he had to be restored publicly before the disciples, number one, because Peter's heart needed to get basically these things right with the Lord. He needed restoration with Jesus. But also he needed restoration with the other apostles. If Jesus is willing to forgive him and say he's again going to use him, then shouldn't the other apostles trust him? And so often when God brings these things in our lives as conviction or as correction and you come to the realization that you've been wrong with him, and now you realize you need to get right with him, you come back to the Lord, he'll work again in your life. There may be some changes depending on what happened. But he'll work again in your life. He'll use you again if you'll make yourself useful to him. And one of the things I love here about Jonah is, again, the word of the Lord came to him. And honestly, from a worldly point of view, the Lord should be finished with him. You're fired. That's it. But God gives him another opportunity. Here is grace in the Old Testament. The word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time, saying, exact same admonition or command. Arise. Go to Nineveh, that great city. Is God patient? He didn't say, I told you, you worthless prophet, that no, same calling, same, I think perhaps even same measured call the second time. Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city. Now, if anybody in the room has been a parent, you know what it's like to instruct and instruct. And the challenge is to continually instruct an area that, say, needs a lot of reinforcing patiently. He's a good father. Go to Nineveh, that great city, a little different now with what we get, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. No holding back. You do what I say. You see, there's a few things going on here. We'll get to them near the end of the book. But knowing the history of the Ninevites and how brutal they are, you can't help but argue that Jonah had to say, I'm not going there. I'm gonna, they're going to kill me. But interestingly enough, as he is being sent back, the reason he ran is he, you know, we'll see it in a few verses. He was worried about God actually giving him a chance to repent. They'll actually get a chance. God will hold off his judgment, and he's going to complain about that. But in running down to Joppa and getting on a ship to Tarshish, he was trying to preserve himself. And how long did that work? Well, let's say that they shoved off from Joppa for maybe they were only about three hours into their tour when the weather started getting rough and that tiny ship was tossed. Not for the courage. He didn't even make it half a day or one day before the guys in the ocean with no rescue who probably would have drowned had God not arranged transportation. So here he is trying to save his life he doesn't get maybe, oh, let's just be conservative. He didn't make it six hours. Now he's being told again to go to Nineveh, which could cost him his life. But what has he learned? 
God could keep him alive, again, we're two minds on this, God could keep him alive for three days in a whale all the way down swimming around within the Mediterranean and bring him back out, or even beyond that, God was able to revive him, pull his soul back out of Sheol, stick it back into his body. He woke up and went, oh, oh still in the fish, and then blah, out he goes. One way or the other, he either kept him alive for three days there, or he revived him and brought him back to life and then chucked him out on the beach and told him to go. When you are in the midst of God's will, you're safe. No matter how weird it is or where you're going, there are missionaries we pray for, one who goes into Syria, and they keep praying God would just give him his life as a prize. He's going into very dangerous areas, going in and serving God's people and encouraging and witnessing the people. And yet, you know, if he's doing what God wants him to do, then God is going to protect him, just as he'll protect you. But we have in this culture around us now this, this fear of if I actually stand for God on some issue, you know, bad things might come my way. And listen, he'll be with you. Anything he allows you is a plan if you truly understand him and know him. The statement has often been said, as long as God has something for you to do, you're untouchable. But once the work of God in your life is finished, then it's time to come home and he'll bring you home. I personally don't want to be here one minute longer than God would have me to be here, and I don't want to be here one minute less. I pray God gets out of my life all the things he intended to do through it for his glory, for having redeemed me from my sin. And so you've got to keep that in mind, that your life is ultimately in the hand of God. I love the missionary stories. Guys like Bruce Olson and Bruchko, I mention them over the years, and I read it to my kids, and the, the guy's got, he, he falls asleep. He's been fasting. He's too busy trying to get out of the jungle. He falls asleep to find an 18-inch or so long tapeworm in his mouth because he's so hungry that the tapeworm got hungry, and so it decided to go up the esophagus going, hey, where's the food? And he pulls the thing out, wakes up, and thinks he's, he's having a dream of butterflies in his mouth, only to wake up with his 18-inch long tapeworm that was looking to see if there was something in the, the ice box to eat. The guy was shot. The guy had jaundice. The guy was bleeding constantly. I mean, everything wrong you can think of, and God kept this man alive for decades in the middle of the Colombian jungle. If God's hand's on your life, you don't have to be afraid. Remember, to live is Christ, to die is gain. And Jonah has just been schooled that God can keep you alive no matter what comes your way. Or worse, if they take you out, God can raise you up again, depending on which way things went there in the belly of the whale with Jonah. So Jonah arose, verse 3, chapter 3, and he went unto Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Doesn't mention him showering, doesn't mention him changing his clothes, doesn't give us any idea of what it looks like to be in the digestive juices of a great fish for three days. He simply rolls into town. Now, Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days' walk or journey. And Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey, and he cried. And he said, yet 40 days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Eight simple words. Yet 40 days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. You are finished in 40 days. Boldness will be given to you from the Lord when you need it. And you can count on boldness, right, Ray? Doing evangelism, going out and meet with people. Boldness will be given to you from the Lord when you need it. And if you go in obedience to the Lord, you will find you'll get caught up in dialogues and interactions and you, you walk away like, wow. And you walk away like, man, and you realize God gave you a boldness to reach people and speak truth to them. Not arrogance, not, not cutting, not caustic, not, but just God will empower you for what he wants to do through you. But to experience that empowering, like Peter, you got to step out of the boat, and then you'll learn with Jesus you can walk on water. It's always that first step of obedience will be met by the firmness of God's faithfulness. And so 40 days, none of it will be overthrown. This was a different man than before he took that ride in the fish. So the people of Nineveh believed God, proclaimed a fast, put on sackcloth from the greatest of them even to the least of them. That had to be challenging to Jonah. People begin to cry out, changing outfits, calling out. For the word came unto the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne and laid his robe from him and covered him with sackcloth and sat 
and ashes. Now, we learned last week some important historical background, and don't worry, we won't go through all of it again. But again, this coming from biblical, the Biblical Archaeological Society, Biblical Archaeological Review, January, February 1991. The title is Grizzly Assyrian Record of Torture and Death by Erica Bilib Trio. And one of the things that was mentioned in the article is it said in all of these inscriptions, these cuneiform inscriptions that they had in their palace, in all these inscriptions, the king stands at the top of the hierarchy, the most powerful person. He himself represents the state. All public acts are recorded as his achievements. All acts worthy of being recorded are attributed only to the Assyrian king, the focus of the ancient world. We also learn from their own documentation and inscriptions. The inscriptions and pictorial evidence provide both detailed information regarding the Assyrian treatment of conquered people, their armies, and their rulers. In his official royal inscriptions, Asher Nasirpal II calls himself, quote, the trampler of all enemies who defeated all his enemies and hung their corpses of his enemies on posts. You see, the treatment of captured enemies often depended on the readiness to submit themselves to the will of the Assyrian king. So here the Assyrian king hears there's a greater king who's about to bring judgment against his kingdom. Interestingly enough, he leads the nation in repentance, goes right to sackcloth, right to ashes, and understanding from their own worldview that if you go easy and you surrender, we'll go easy on you. He immediately calls the entire nation to humble themselves and surrender quickly before God in hopes that their repentance will bring to them an easier treatment from the Lord. It is consistent with how the Assyrians roll. Interesting. Thanks to history now, he's acting in character to them as a people. As they treated others now, he is quickly seeking that treatment from God. So the people of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed a fast. They put on sackcloth from the greatest of them even to the least of them. For the word came unto the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, laid his robe from him, and covered himself in, in the rough, showing repentance sackcloth that he would wear, and sat in ashes. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published throughout Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast nor herd nor flock taste anything. Let them not feed nor drink water. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. Yea, let them turn everyone from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. This guy's a better preacher than Jonah. Jonah said, 40 days, you're done. The king hears it and gives the practical application. Knock off the violence, humble yourselves, turn away from your evil, Seek unto God, and maybe he'll have mercy on us. It's really interesting, some of the people God will use to get his truth out, isn't it? The prescription is a right one. And again, as the leader of the nation of Assyria, if he says do it, they do it. Who can tell, verse 9, if God will repent, and the idea is, or comfort, and turn away from his fierce anger, that we perish not. This is a guy who understood surrender, and he was calling his people to do the very thing. God saw their works. What do their works demonstrate? Well, James goes through the argument, you say you have faith. James says, well, I'm gonna show you my faith by my works. When Jesus will return, and he is coming, and when the nations are gathered before him, as Daniel tells us in chapter 12, and Jesus himself told us in Matthew 25, 31, he's going to divide the sheep from the goats. And it is going to be their works that he examines. And their works, or the lack thereof, show in the case of the works that he commends their faith and shows in the places where they failed their unbelief. You can learn a lot about people by watching them. And if you watch people, you'll often, kind of, you'll often learn where their priorities are and what's their faith really like. Works are a manifestation of what we believe. If we really believed the roof was going to collapse in three seconds, you would all be running for the exits. 
But if we were to say that, and I included, just sat here going, yep, it's coming down in three seconds. Ready? Two, one. If I'm still sitting here, then obviously I don't believe it either. My works demonstrate my faith or my unbelief. These things show you where you're coming from, interestingly enough. God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way. And God repented, or again, our word comfort, comforted of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them. And he did it not. So profound was this change of heart that Jesus will bring it up to us in Matthew 12. So let's turn right hand to Matthew 12. Jesus makes mention of these guys and is actually saying they will rise in judgment. He said to us, now, just for background, in Matthew chapter 12, verse 22, there was brought unto Jesus one possessed with a devil, insomuch that the blind and the mute, or dumb, both spake and saw. The Jews felt that you had to get the name of the entity or the demon that was inhabiting someone so that you could drive them out. And so according to their different traditions, if someone were mute, therefore the person could not disclose the name. And so for many of the Jews, they viewed that type of possession as being hopeless. And so here Jesus not only heals the blindness, but also restores to him speech. And it is so uh, you know, unusual in their world that verse 23, all the people were amazed and they said, is this not the son of David? Let me translate. Is this not the Messiah? Is what they're saying. But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, this fellow does not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of devils. They said, not only is it not divine, it is satanic. And Jesus, knowing their thoughts, gave them a lesson about houses being divided, which our country ought to remind itself of. But then in verse 38, it says, then certain of the scribes and the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see a miraculous sign from you. Wait a second. What did he just do? Healed an impossible case. But Jesus answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign. By the way, they were calling him the son of David, and he was opening the eyes of the blind, and the mute were speaking, which are all signs of the Messiah. Isaiah 35, 42, and elsewhere. An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given unto it, but the sign of the prophet, here's our hero, Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And as Jonah exited the whale's belly after those three days and three nights, essentially unharmed, so Jesus himself will also exit the grave after three days, and he will be resurrected and unharmed. He went on then to say in verse 41, The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation. When God brings the nations before him and the generations and brings forth his judgment against them, they will rise up and condemn the generation that saw Jesus in his miracles because they repented at the preaching of Jonah, who had a little help from the king of Nineveh. And behold, a greater than Jonah is here. The queen of the south will rise up in the judgment with this generation and shall condemn it. For she came from the uttermost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, a greater than Solomon is here. Again, this lesson, when an unclean spirit has gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places seeking rest and findeth none. And then he saith, I will return into my house from whence I came out, where they were driven out. And when he has come, he findeth it empty. That's why you want to receive Christ. Swept and garnished. And for one who refuses to accept who Jesus is, you're left empty. Then goeth he and taketh with himself seven other spirits more wicked than himself, they enter in and they dwell therein, and the last state of that man is worse than the first. Even so shall it be unto this wicked generation. They had such light from God, and refusing it, they are going to go to even greater darkness, to where they will eventually reject him, and then they will be destroyed and cast away. So the people of Nineveh believed God. Back to Jonah. And God saw their works that they turned from their evil way, and God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them, and he did it not. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was very angry. <laughs> Interesting, he, in one story here, has become first a prodigal, and now the older brother who's upset. He's pulled off two characters for us. And he prayed unto the Lord, and he said, I pray thee, O Lord, was this not my saying when I was yet in my country? Well, if it was, it wasn't recorded for us initially. And when God told him to go to Nineveh, Jonah 
if this conversation happened, said, why should I go? You're just going to forgive them. Wait a second. Why would that be such a horrible job to be sent as a prophet to warn them of judgment and see people repent and see them get right with God? Why is that so egregious? Uh, what, a, what a great job. He didn't want any part of it. Was this not my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore I fled for, before thee unto Tarshish. For I knew that thou art a gracious God, which leads us to a very uncomfortable truth here then. If he knows God's gracious, and he knows when he rebukes them, if they turn, God will forgive them. It's almost as though Jonah had written the Ninevites off as not worthy of being forgiven. And that's a dangerous place to get. When we begin to determine who we think God wants to reach and who we can't be bothered to try to reach because for some reason we don't like them or they don't look like us or they come from a whole different world and therefore we just write them off. We have no interest in helping these people. Very dangerous place to be, where you don't want to give God's truth to someone who might be, like the Ninevites, quite rebellious, quite gnarly, and perhaps quite different than you, and yet God loves them. Be careful writing off people. Be careful deciding who you think you should or shouldn't share the hope of Christ. Interesting. I knew that you're a gracious God, merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness. What a great boss. And repent if you will comfort, turn from the evil. So I know all these things about you, yet he didn't want to extend that to the people of Nineveh. Therefore now, O Lord, take, I beseech thee, my life from me. <laughs> you get out of the fish and now you want to quit? Take my life from me. For it is better for me to die than to live. He is so upset that these people are getting forgiven that he'd rather just be finished. Not exactly an equivalent, but something I've seen. A wife or a husband, for whatever reason, gets caught in an affair. There are hows and whys and what happened and shouldn't have happened and what a whoever, but it happens devastating to the marriage, whether it's the husband who's in my office or the wife who's in my office, the victim of what the other has done to them, brokenhearted, family just shattered, all the things that are going on. And we pray and we seek God, and we ask God to turn that hard heart, and, and by the grace of God we've seen, whether it's a wife or a husband stepping out of a marriage who gets so convicted, God deals with them so severely, you can see repentance, there, you don't need subtitles, it's obvious God has truly dealt with that person, and they, like Paul said to the Corinthians, seek to clear themselves of anything they've done and get right and be accountable, whatever, and, and it's clear they want, they want nothing to do with what they've done, and they want everything to do with trying to heal and bring forgiveness and, and restore themselves with their family. And the wife who was the victim of, or the husband who was the victim of their spouse's infidelity, by the grace of God, finds it in their heart to forgive them, to love them again, takes time to trust them again, and to see the marriage healed, and indeed it gets healed. I think one of the things that's the most painful is sometimes the people around that couple that were aware of it, you'll encounter some people who, even though the wife or the husband's forgiven them, they still have a problem with the offending spouse. And they, well, and they, and we don't want, and all that, and it's a shame because. The rule of thumb I have is, look, if the guy's wife or the guy's or the, or the lady's husband's willing to forgive them and restore them, shouldn't we? But there's times where something really bad happens and someone truly gets broken and truly gets repentant. And sadly, some of the people around them, and rather than saying, praise God, it's been healed and they're back, still keep them at arm's length. Jonah's so upset, he says, take my life from me. It's better for me to die than to live. He's absolutely outraged. So now God has to minister to his prophet on dry land. And he said, doest thou well to be angry? Do you, you got a right here to be angry, Jonah? Is that wise? So Jonah went out of the city and sat on the east side of the city. Again, it's on the eastern side of the Tigris. And he made him there a booth. So they cut the branches and lay him across, give you some shelter, kind of like they do during Sukkot or Tabernacles. Made himself a booth. And he sat under it in the shadow, because it's hot out there, that he might see what would become of the city. Now, let's just assume he stayed all 40 days. Let's just go with that as a working number, <laughs> perhaps holding out hope that maybe day 39. 
But he's waiting there. And interestingly enough, when the Ninevites would say, say, where's that guy who smelled like fish who was telling us we're going to be done? Where is he? Oh, he's outside the city. What's he doing there? We made this little like Kwanzaa hut thing. And, and he's just, what's he doing? He's just watching the city. Would that not bring conviction to you as a Ninevite that he didn't just go, you're in trouble and run away. He said, you're in trouble. And then he went, where's my popcorn? That would send a convicting message, wouldn't it? That, hey, that guy's still out there waiting to see what's going to happen. So he made him a booth and he sat under the shadow of it till he might see what would become of the city. And so the Lord prepared, here's another thing God prepared for him, a gourd, a plant. And he made it to come up over Jonah that he might be a shadow over his head. Even a little break from the sun in the Middle East, man, is, is amazing. That it might be a shadow over his head to deliver him from his grief. So Jonah was exceeding glad of the gourd. You know, it's useful, sweet. But God prepared a worm. That's a tola or tola in the Hebrew, which is worm. Also translated scarlet. Uh, you look the word up, it's kind of a little red bug. God prepared a worm in this little red bug when the morning arose the next day. And it smote the gourd that it withered. Now, look, don't get too harsh. It's just a bug trying to make a living and eat something. The bug does what it's supposed to do. It found something it likes. It eats it. It apparently is detrimental to the gourd. The gourd immediately begins to wither. And it's real hot out there, so it wouldn't take much. And it came to pass when the sun did arise that God prepared a vehement east wind. And the sun beat upon the head of Jonah. Again, we wonder if he lost his hair from the stomach acid of the fish. We'll have to find out. It beat upon the head of Jonah, and he fainted, and he wished in himself. At least he's keeping his mouth shut, but he's at the same place. He wished in himself to die. And he said, it is better for me to die than to live. I hope you're not there this evening in your rebellion to God. God has you here for a reason. God has you here to work in your life and work through your life. And things could be extremely bad, and, and listen, with all that's happened with COVID, there may be people who are listening later on the radio or you're live streaming this evening or watching it later on YouTube or whatever. And, and this lockdown and, and COVID and all that's happened has cost you your business. It may have even now cost you your home because you were in business for yourself. You, you're not sure what you're going to do next. You've got all kinds of trouble coming your way. And you, you sit there and you start getting that wrong idea of, you know, I'd be better off dead. You know, hold on there. Because... That means you're never going to see what God could have done to, to fix it. And what God could have done to show you he's faithful. And what God could have done to restore you. And perhaps even brought you to a place through this where you're actually in a better position than when you started this whole thing thinking you were set. Very important. When you get so discouraged, you feel like my life isn't worth living. Let me tell you something. You are being lied to. You're being lied to by the kingdom of darkness. You're being deceived to do something that is ultimately only in God's hands, and that is when your last day should come. And you are going to leave behind with the people you say you love. First of all, great sorrow, outrage, shame to try and explain what happened to you. And often what I've seen over time, usually about a year later, anger. How could you have done this to us? And you will never see what God could have done and you're going to stand before the one who gave you your life and have to give an account for what you did with it. No matter how bad things may be, God can do anything if you will give him the time. you got to wait on him. So the Lord again said to Jonah, verse 9, Dost thou well to be angry? Same question, second time. You sure you got a right for this? Do you, you do well to be angry? For the gourd, now it's becoming an object lesson. Same question, one more thing attached, the gourd. And that's going to be our teachable moment. And Jonah said, I do well. I'm concerned, even though he's on land, he's entered into another fish. Now he's caught in selfish. I do well to be angry, even unto death. Then said the Lord, thou hast had pity on the gourd, for which thou hast not labored. And the reason he had pity on the gourd is because it had served a purpose and was useful to Jonah. Therefore, he was upset because here this gourd grew up. It gave him some shade. It served a wonderful purpose. It helped to cool his head. Things were fine. And then the gourd was gone, and now he's upset because something that had value and purpose to him is suddenly taken away. That's the heart of it. Neither made it grow 
which came up in a night and perished in a night. Should I not spare Nineveh, that great city, which has a purpose for God? And God will use. In fact, interestingly enough, Jonah preaching, we think about 760 B.C., it will be 40 years after this that, that the Assyrians are going to come in and judge the northern kingdom of Israel. They are going to be God's rod of correction, and they actually show up multiple times in Israel's history. They show up at different places. We'll see it. They have been a corrected rod against them. And just before God uses the Ninevites to correct the evil of Israel, he brought them to their knees, basically, about how wicked they have been. So God rebuked them, and then within 20 years, they come, or 40 years, they come rolling in, and they are used as a rod of judgment against the Israelis who had sinned against God, who had not kept the Sabbath, and had fallen into idolatry, and completely sinned in the light of God's word. Interesting. They will be used as a rod of correction, but God rebukes them first. God had a plan even in Nineveh. Shall I not spare Nineveh, that great city, wherein there are more than six score thousand, 120,000 persons that cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand? Who generally don't know the difference from the right and left hand? Children. There are some adults. I know one. When you say go left, they have to go, and then they make their turn because only one of their hands snaps. That's how they figure out if it's right or left. And they're uh, an adult, like a well-established adult. Quick, go left. It's interesting. I'll hear once in a while. Can't disclose where, but I'll hear, and then I'll see an action. I know that person's figuring out which hand they needed to take. But generally, it's children. They don't know their right hand from their left. That is a cognitive function that comes with time. They cannot discern between the right hand and their left hand. Interestingly enough, and also in that town are much cattle. Again, there are living creatures in the town of Nineveh that even though it's wicked, having turned from these things, God's willing to have mercy on them. You know, when it mentions they put sackcloth in the animals and all that, you might laugh at that, but in the case of some Persian kings, when a Persian general had died, they actually not only shaved themselves, they shaved their horses. So these things are documented in history. This major turning by the, the Assyrians or the Ninevites moved the heart of God, and God spared them. So Jonah, you're worried about a little gourd. I have thousands in there. In many ways, don't know their right hand from their left. And honestly, in all of the scope of things, are completely innocent. And God is willing to spare them. It brings up a question that is argued, and that is, what is the age of accountability? You might say, well, what does the term age of accountability mean? Well, the answer is inherent in the question, and that is an age at which God begins to hold men and women accountable for their actions before him. And so it is argued that there's a certain place in time or up to a certain place in time that because they do not yet have the cognitive function to discern good from evil, that they come under the grace of God. Jesus said to us, Matthew 19 and Matthew 18, suffer the little children to come unto me for such is the kingdom of God. He said, unless you become like little children, not child, childish, but childlike willing to quickly turn, willing to repent, willing to seek forgiveness. Children are very quick to restore when they know they're wrong. Unless you become like little children, you will in no wise inherit the kingdom of God. Isaiah the prophet, when he was giving a sign to Ahaz, who was dealing with Syria, not Assyria, but Syria and Israel, the sign was given to him for his immediate time that there would be a virgin who would be with child, and that would be Isaiah's wife, we find out over time. He marries this woman. They produce a child. Calls name Malashala Hazbaz, just in case you're looking for a name. And he tells him, before this child will know to discern good and evil, be able to taste honey and different things, chapter 7, chapter 8, before this child reaches this cognitive ability, the two nations that are tormenting you in southern Israel, that is the northern kingdom and the Syrians, are going to be judged. And the Syrians were judged in 732, roughly, and the, southern, the northern kingdom judged in 722. And before that child really reached kind of that age of accountability, both of those kings who had harassed Ahaz, the king of southern Israel, were gone. And so God used there again this idea of before a child acquires a cognitive ability, a judgment is going to occur and is going to handle these things. Where does that leave us? It seems the judge of all the earth, as we look at the word, handles people on an individual basis. And in the case of people who have a, a restriction of their cognitive function, whether they be a small child, or I would even argue perhaps some that we view as having special needs or special issues, 
You know, people ask me, does my son or daughter who has a really difficult condition, do you think they have any knowledge of God? And my answer is, don't you think the judge of all the earth can reach anyone he wants? The grace of God. But this idea of this, this age of accountability, this time where there's grace extended, the question always comes up, well, when do they cross the line? I think it's individual between the individual and God. And I think it's essential when you come to the knowledge that there is a God, you need to repent, you need to get right with him, don't wait, because you never know when you'll be taken home. But with those thoughts, and I can't prove it until we're out of here, it is my heartfelt hope, and looking at Jesus, bringing the little children to himself, it is my heartfelt desire that when God abruptly removes his church, it is my prayer and it is my expectation that he is going to take not only the church, but I think perhaps even the children below that age, below that place of accountability. I may be wrong, and I may be wrong for a long time, but it would be my hope that when you're going to leave a world that has no more salt, no more light, and is absolute darkness, and a strong delusion is coming, it is my heartfelt hope God is going to pull children out from all around the world. I may be wrong, but it's interesting, if he were to take all those children who have that innocence out, it would suddenly turn the entire world, like this pandemic, into a global panic of where do we go, what happened, what happened to these people, and suddenly here comes a strong delusion and a rising antichrist. I don't know, but as I look at it, it is my hope that the heart of God will spare those of that time period. You can make fun of me for a long time in heaven, but I'm willing to make the gamble and think he will take them out. So here we have Jonah sitting outside the city, upset that God's merciful. I'd say he's a bit out of alignment with God, but God will work in his life. Sadly, Nineveh did repent for a period of time, but then eventually would go back to their wickedness. We're going to get to Nahum. Nahum is going to come back and again prophesy against them. These guys got two different prophets to warn them. But in 612 BC, listen to this carefully in light of what's going on in the United States. In 612 BC, after a bitter period of civil war in Assyria, it was sacked by a coalition of its former subject peoples, the Babylonians, the Medes, the Chaldeans, the Persians, the Scythians, and this, with a letter C, the Cimmeranians. And the city never again was a political or administrative center. It lies in ruins today across from the city of Mansul. What brought it down was internal civil war, which weakened them and their enemies came in wipe them out. Jonah. Father, we thank you for your word. Pray for anyone here this evening listening or listening in the future who doesn't know you. And they've wanted to come and get right with you, but they have this idea. First, they have to clean up their life, put down the heroin or the marijuana or the alcohol or the pornography or the thievery or the promiscuity or the bondage to anger and rage. Lord, I thank you that with the Ninevites as an example, if they would simply turn, you will help them. If they'll turn and ask your forgiveness and surrender their life to your son by faith, asking you to be their savior, trusting from their heart you rose from the dead and confessing gladly with their mouth that you are their Lord, their savior, their king. You will hear from heaven. You will change them and you will draw them to yourself. So, Lord, I lift up anyone this evening that perhaps is even in a place of great despair. May they look again to you. May they find you because you promise that we will seek you and we will find you when we search for you with all of our heart. May their hearts be open tonight and may they truly be drawn to you and walk with you, we pray, afresh and anew. In Jesus' name, amen.